It's 2 p.m. and we can start our conference. So I am uh, welcome to all participants of this session devoted to economic concepts. Uh, and the rules of the game as usual, 20 minutes for presentations, 10 minutes for discussions, questions, comments. And that's all, we can start. Uh, so since according to the schedule, my presentation is the first, so probably I should start this. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, great. Uh, so uh, the point which, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, reason to ask this question about profit upon alienation is uh, my some kind of interest in pre-classical economic thought, uh, which, uh, which is usually in the histories of economic thought is conceived according to uh, Adam Smith's story in his uh, fourth book of the Wealth of Nation, he wrote that there were some predecessors of his system, mercantilism or mercantile system and physiocracy. And these two systems are shown by Adam Smith as something flawed, something mistaken, especially mercantile system, uh, physiocracy is assessed a, bit, a little bit better, but uh, never, uh, never mind, uh, these two systems were a kind of background for his own system. And I think that for the purposes of uh, Adam Smith himself, it was quite reasonable. But after Adam Smith, this scheme became a kind of mainstream in the history of economic thought. And to my understanding, it uh, remains the same until now, even if there emerged some textbooks uh, and some, uh, uh, some textbooks which, uh, which try to escape this um, scheme. Of course, uh, later after marginal revolution, there appeared one more element in this uh, general history, but still we have something more or less uh, scientific starting from classical school and uh, something pre-scientific or half scientific in, in case of physiocracy and pre-scientific in case of physiocracy, uh, of mercantilism. So this is the kind of Adam Smith parable which is dominating until now. And I think well, and, and then we had a lot of uh, uh, historians of thought, and not only historians of thought, who were trying to mm, refute actually such scheme. Uh, the third, uh, first attempts uh, we can uh, locate in uh, his historical school, German historical school in the middle of the 19th century, but uh, it was especially connected with Schmoller who wrote uh, specifically on uh, mercantilism uh, and uh, was trying to reassess this phenomenon. And he saw at least not as a kind of mistaken uh, school of thought, but as, uh, as a reasonable uh, because of specific historical uh, circumstances of the time, uh, nation state formation and as a kind of part of this uh, major process. Uh, more or less the same, uh, but from the point of view of history of economic thought uh, was done by Heckscher in the 20th century, early 20th century, who, re, uh, who also tried to reassess uh, mercantile system as a reasonable even if uh, flawed system in many respects, 
Uh, but uh, anyhow, it was a kind of uh, reasonable part of the history of economic thought. And of course, uh, Keynes was important to as a, uh, another step uh, to reassessment of mercantile system. Uh, in his general theory, as well known, he devoted a whole chapter to mercantilism uh, to show once again reasonableism, uh, reasonableness of this uh, of the doctrines developed by uh, mercantilist authors. Uh, also, uh, uh, with uh, with uh, re uh, relation to the circumstances of time, uh, but in this case he was uh, writing about rhythms of theories uh, of this some of mercantilistic theories as a response to uh, specific uh, circumstances circumstances uh, conditions of economic development. Uh, so there is a uh, first important step uh, to reassessment of mercantile system, but still uh, it was not influential in uh, the general uh, courses of the history of economic thought. Uh, it was not influenced them, I think, at all. Uh, contemporary uh, um, history of economic thought we can find a lot of uh, writings. Uh, the most even uh, authoritative authors such as Lars Magnusson in this field, uh, who continues this Keynesian uh, start, uh, Keynesian position to reassess uh, this phenomenon from the point of view of history of economic ideas. And from this point of view, we have uh, once again a situation when a specialist in the history of economic thought uh, shows uh, some kind of progress in economic thinking uh, secured by the authors of this mercantile uh, period. Uh, but once again, uh, the influence on our general understanding of the general uh, professional view of these uh, path of development of economic uh, thought uh, does not change, uh, doesn't change. Well, now we have another attempt uh, following uh, Keynesian uh, example to reassess uh, uh, some mercantilistic ideas belonging to Eric Reinhardt, who shown that the main, maybe main or one of the main mercantilistic ideas uh, about uh, the uh, well, this protectionist uh, element in uh, mercantilism uh, was not flawed because uh, he connected this idea with the later Marshallian uh, idea of uh, increasing returns and showed that uh, the industries uh, more, more uh, technologically or advanced are better just because of uh, increasing return, uh, returns in these fields. And that's why uh, investments into different industries are not uh, the same as classical uh, paradigm implied. So we have a lot of arguments in favor to reassessment of the place of uh, mercantilist uh, system in the history of economic thought, but still, uh, we have very little uh, changes in general history of economic thought. And so I uh, try to think about one more uh, idea, which is still uh, considered to be, uh, to be a, a kind of sin in mercantiline, mercantilistic uh, thought. So we can uh, take from the current literature, that there are some things which are now forgiven, uh, such as uh, this Midas delusion, which is in, in Smith, uh, neglect of his investments, irrelevance of economic policy. Well, thanks to uh, Heckscher, uh, Magnusson, Ryan, and others, these sins are forgiven. But still, uh, there is another sin profit upon alienation, which is still unforgiven. 
uh, and uh, it's necessary to, I think, to, to look at it a bit more uh, specifically. Well, this uh, uh, actual phrase comes from late mercantilist, or sometimes not mercantilist, uh, James Stewart. And in James Stewart, we uh, see the following, something like, like this formula on the screen, that commodity price uh, consists uh, from two, in two parts. So some kind of real value based on costs and profit upon alienation, uh, which is according to the uh, according to uh, Stuart, fluctuating according to circumstances. So this uh, phrase is understood usually that, and rightly understood in, in relation to Stuart, I think, that uh, it is uh, the situation when uh, gain of one partner is a loss for another partner. So there is no additional value uh, emerging from this um, uh, profit upon alienation. That is the, the point. So the point is whether uh, trade uh, produce some kind of uh, value or not. And uh, here we, we have, uh, of course, some a lot of uh, proofs that in mercantile uh, literature, there is an idea that the gain of one subject is the loss of another. Classical mercantilist Thomas Mann uh, wrote it uh, directly. So uh, no pure gain from trade. This idea existed in this mercantile literature. Uh, and so uh, something we can find as a accusation uh, of uh, this mercantile li literature that they uh, considered at the, at the same time that trade uh, produced wealth. Wealth. But in Ricardo, uh, the situation is uh, reconciled in a very cu uh, curious way. Uh, value of all foreign goods is measured by the quantity of the produce of our land and labor, our land, so the exporting country. And therefore, of course, uh, nothing uh, additional could be derived from this. But uh, in, in uh, uh, Marx, we, we have the same. Actually, Marx uh, was, uh, uh, well, was sure that trade do not produce value. And therefore, uh, this uh, profit upon alienation in Stuart was a rational expression of the monetary and mercantile systems of Marx. Uh, so he also shared uh, this idea that um, uh, Stuart actually uh, denied uh, the uh, also existing in mercantile lit literature idea that uh, trade is the main source of wealth. Uh, despite this uh, Thomas Mann, uh, Mann uh, phrase about uh, no pure gain. Uh, but of course, we can find a lot uh, expressions that uh, it, it is traded that uh, produce wealth, and in man also, not only this. Uh, this uh, actually, this phrase in man uh, is not clear whether it is about uh, foreign trade or not. It is more general, but uh, uh, this idea existed. I, I do not deny this. So, but uh, but still, uh, there is a problem, whether uh, it is uh, really as Stuart was writing, uh, whether uh, this uh, trade do not uh, contribute to value, value. And here we are coming to some kind of uh, more specific analysis of these uh, critical remarks by Ricardo and Marx. As for Ricardo, uh, he wrote also that we should have no greater value if by the discovery of new markets, we obtained double the quantity of foreign goods in exchange for a given quantity of powers. So he acknowledged that uh, wealth is gained from trade. And actually then later we'll see it that uh, actually the idea of uh, comparative advantage is, yes, trade is advantages. 
Uh, but why, how uh, in Ricardia's system, uh, this uh, idea was uh, reconciled with the previous idea? Uh, there are two assumptions behind this scene, so to say. Uh, he uh, is basing on Adam Smith's distinctions of value and use value. And the first uh, denial of uh, additional value is based on uh, value counting, while uh, this uh, uh, letter uh, phrase is based on use value uh, counting. So there is a gain in use, use value, but not in value. And in Ricardo, it is uh, actually by definition how he defined value. Uh, there, is, there cannot be uh, more value there. And from this uh, goes to, uh, two implications gains in value unconnected with those in use value. And denial of gain in value is tautological, as I said. Uh, but of course, uh, it is a kind of counterintuitive and not only counterintuitive, but it, it, it brings uh, senseless uh, the counting in value in this case. So there is uh, gain in wealth, but no in value. So, so what uh, what is uh, what is value this? So th th this case shows that uh, Ricardian de definitions of value does not work well in relation to uh, foreign trade, uh, let's say. Uh, let's go to Marx. Uh, in Marx, we can find uh, a lot about uh, distinction uh, of uh, theoretical view and historical view. As is well known, Marx was very interested in history. And in his historical uh, chapters, a special chapter on merchant capital, we can see that he uh, acknowledged that uh, absence, uh, there was absence of uh, general rate of profit. And of course, a lot of wealth and value as well. Uh, was coming uh, through trade and actually uh, uh, accumulation, uh, primitive accumulation in Marx is much based on uh, foreign trade and trade in general, but especially in foreign trade. Uh, this is a historical argument which uh, says that uh, for Marx it was not a problem with uh, the idea of mercantile system that uh, trade was a source of enrichment. Uh, but there is another argument uh, quite theoretical in Marx, uh, which differentiate uh, Marxian uh, value theory from Ricardian uh, value theory. Because Marxian value theory is based on the idea of socially necessary labor costs. Uh, it implied uh, a reproduction view of value. So adaptation of asset value to the present conditions of, the, uh, of their production. And in this case, we can look uh, at uh, the uh, imported uh, commodities also from this point of view and to uh, count it according to uh, the uh, uh, production conditions of these imported commodities, not uh, exported commodities. And then, uh, of course, uh, we can find, uh, we can get to this non-tautological view of the gains of, of trade. Uh, the problem behind this, uh, this uh, phrase, this co concept, is that uh, we have, in case of uh, foreign trade, different valuation systems of two countries. And under conditions when these two countries are not one market, and they are not market, and this fact is uh, recognized both by Marx and by, uh, uh, by Ricardo, by John Stuart Mill and others. They are not. And if not, then we, we cannot uh, compare uh, these values uh, directly. Uh, so I, I have to uh, finish. Uh, responses to, well, responses to this uh, problem, which partly understood by the authors, was a reference to the general globalization trend, those one standard unified market. Well, some 
sometime uh, later, there was one market and uh, the general theory will work. Uh, okay, it was not, of course, the case in mercantile times uh, because of monopolies in foreign trade, because of uh, different countries and uh, quite different systems of valuation and so on. And the, so uh, it is a kind of theoretical argument which was not relevant as a description of reality. And second, comparative advantage uh, doctrine, which was a pragmatic, which was not appealing to this general theory. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, how this comparative advantage doctrine is, is, is related to this uh, uh, notion of uh, profit upon, uh, upon uh, alienation. Well, uh, here is uh, the, uh, I, I just reminding you the Ricardian example. I, I want to use it to, to finalize my argument. Uh, so uh, usually we, uh, and Ricardo himself, uh, was uh, comparing uh, England and Portugal in, in terms of labor, uh, in terms of workers necessary to produce certain products. Uh, but it is, uh, well, it is shown actually by the idea of comparative advantage that it is not uh, relevant and it is not uh, necessary for the idea of comparative advantage. What is relevant is a proportion within each country, within these valuation systems. So that is relevant. And if we have these two systems and we have some kind of, uh, not some kind, but certain kind of exchange, uh, one uh, set of uh, products to another set of products, then we can uh, think if it is advantageous or not to each country. And the case uh, dis uh, discussed by Ricardo, they are advantageous, but so, uh, if we are looking at this example from the position of reproduction uh, value of Marx, then we can see uh, that um, these gains uh, could be interpreted as value gains. Of course, according to Marx, it is not because of trade itself. It was because of trade, it was a labor on the uh, importing uh, country. But uh, without trade, this uh, value cannot be gained. So that is actually the main argument. I wanted to, uh, to present to you. And here are uh, just uh, conclusions that uh, profit upon alienation as a doctrine can be, uh, is not flawed in general. It might be of course uh, in some uh, situations uh, flawed, but not, theoretically necessary. Uh, and that's why uh, this argument, which is very much rooted in the uh, classical theory, and that's why maybe uh, we are still at our uh, Adam Smith uh, parable. So this parable should be refuted. Uh, however, imperfect mercantilist literature was not a false start in economic reasoning, and we have uh, some kind of important step forward the, uh, here. And uh, it was also my interest in this research uh, because I am very much interested in the contribution of uh, Cantillon. I think that Cantillon is a figure who was not only a predecessor for, for, for physiocrats or classical school, but it also uh, a, a, a person who, summarize mercantilistic good ideas, so to say. That is important. Uh, so he was uh, a kind of at the crossroad of the history of economic thought uh, on the path from pre-scientific economic thought to scientific economic thought. And that's all uh, what I wanted to say. I have only five minutes for discussion. Thank you. If anybody have questions. Yes. If, if no questions. I have one question. Yes. Yeah, Vishal, probably Vishal goes first. 
No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine, Ivan. Go first. Uh, yeah, very small. How would you how would you describe? I mean, the the there is a very common as, uh, association, probably not uh, really responding to all or covering all the mercantilists, but there is kind of a widespread popular view that mercantilist uh, ideas are associated with this zero sum game idea of trade, so that the you always have that someone loses and someone uh, gains. So there is no pure gain of trade. How would you fit this stereotype or let's say common belief into this story? Uh, well, you see, uh, there is an idea is mercantilistic uh, literature, as I said, uh, of this type. But at the same time, there is a quite opposite idea that uh, actually wealth is gained by trade at the same time. So I think that uh, it is connected with another accusation to, uh, to mercantil, mercantil, mercantilism, uh, accusation which is actually refuted in, especially clear, clearly refuted in uh, Thomas Mann's uh, famous uh, pamphlet, where he explains that uh, what, uh, well, uh, he's, uh, I, I just uh, can, uh, money begets trade and trade increased money, this uh, 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 phrase. So, so he, he implied that uh, foreign trade is a way of gaining money and investing this money. So it is uh, money as money capital, it is money capital. So it is uh, the way to make investments. That is the idea actually in Keynesian defense of mercantilism and so on. So uh, the idea that in fact, uh, foreign trade was a kind of investment activity. And that's why uh, they could be well, they, they did not think in terms of uh, value theory of classical theory. So they, they were, uh, uh, this idea of uh, zero trade is based on uh, monetary flows only, monetary flows only. While uh, in terms of uh, wealth, uh, it was a kind of way to, to, to enrich uh, themselves. Well, they could believe that they are enriching only one side they could believe, but they were wrong. Because, uh, and the late mercantilism uh, wrote that it, it, it cannot be so because both sides are, uh, the, the, this trade is free. So both sides are interested in this trade. So it's not. So that, that is the, the, the case with this uh, zero sum trade. Okay, thank you. In any anyone more? Yes, uh, Vishal, please. I was just wondering. I don't have uh, <clears throat> uh, any anything specific about that, um, but I was just uh, I had a similar thing with Ivan because I'm I've been trained in the classical political economist, and when value theory is thrown in, then it becomes a little bit of a, a problem for me to imagine how they cannot be a zero sum game. But I will follow up on that. Uh, what I wanted to really know, sir, was that you mentioned Eric Reinhardt for reassessment, and he said that uh, the protectionist element is not flawed, and he connected to this to the idea of increasing returns in Smith. Uh, I, I just wanted you to quickly just uh, tell me what, what do you mean by that, so I can follow up on that. Uh, well, this is uh, the idea of uh, almost all mercantilists uh, early and, uh, and, and, and others that uh, protectionism should be addressed to, uh, to the industries with high uh, labor uh, inputs, with high labor inputs, but not with uh, industries which are based on uh, products of, uh, of, of land. So it was connected with, um, with labor uh, instead of land. So uh, in Stuart, we have even uh, more uh, general idea that uh, the uh, 
balance of trade should be interpreted as balance of labor. So if you are exchanging uh, products with more labor for products with less labor, it will be advantageous for this country. Uh, and they, they were not appealing to increasing returns, but uh, Eric Reinert is now saying that uh, these two kinds of industries are different because of uh, more intensive labor. And that's why they, well, according to Marshallian logic, uh, are uh, industries of uh, increasing returns. Well, uh, Mauricio? No, just an observation that in Stuart, apart from the profit upon alienation, you do not necessarily have an equilibrium in, in the exchange rate. So, so the, the equilibrium of exchange rate can 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 have a, 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 a can be persistent, and so under these conditions, you have to put monetary discussions and internal versus external prices uh, in the framework to to situation uh, to situate uh, the uh, stewards general framework. J just to add this perspective, whereas for Ricardo you don't have this, for Hume you don't have this. And for Marx, you don't have exchange rate problems also. Uh, mm -hmm. It's quite different, quite different. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that should be considered also. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are coming to our second speaker, uh, Juan Carvajalino, uh, please. Uh, yes. So let me just share my screen. Uh oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Do you see it? Great. Yes, yes, yes. Please. Great. Yes. So, um, so first, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for attending this room and not the others. Um, so as you might guess uh, from the title of uh, the presentation and of the paper, well, this deals with uh, von Neumann. And in some sort of way, it, there is a connection through even a uh, uh, question to uh, the pre uh, previous uh, presentation. So I'm happy about that. Uh, but but that, the link stops there. Right, uh, I think because this paper is really um, um, ideal. I'm, I'm interested in von Neumann, and um, as I guess you can um, feel out of uh, the, the the title, uh, it deals with something that is happening or that happens in the book in this uh, voluminous book, right? Uh, the theory of games and economic behavior, and um, probably perhaps uh, the title is not good enough. It's not optimal in the sense that. It does not convey uh, um, probably the main idea, the, the, the main object of the paper, which is what I'm interested in is really the transition between uh, um, the, the von Neumann's uh, growth model paper, a paper that he published in 1937. And so uh, to see, I'm interested in, in, in studying how he transitioned from that paper to uh, the theory of games, right, to the book. And so um, to that, uh, let's just let me recall that um, uh, these two contributions, uh, the paper and uh, the book, uh, together they kind of have a huge impact, right, in the way uh, subsequent generations of mathematical economists uh, will uh, think about the economy, will model the economy. And uh, of course, I'm thinking about uh, general economic theory, I'm thinking of, uh, about uh, theory of games, I'm thinking of linear programming, uh, um, trade, I'm thinking of capital theory, uh, a lot of uh, different sub-branches of uh, economics that will kind of embody what we mean when we think about the mathematization of economics. Um, and the important thing, uh, or the thing that interests me in this paper is that in all of these subsequent uh, developments that took place after 1945, uh, the uh, uh, for Neumann's work, for Neumann's growth model and his work on games appear uh, uh, um, as a unified block, right? As a unified formal block. Uh, and uh, they also, uh, something that is kind of rec kind of recurrent is that von Neumann's personal and concrete involvement with economics and social science remain kind of a total mystery. So uh, 
Probably let me just reinforce the idea that the mystery here is not only about von Neumann's personal uh, uh, connections with economics, but it is also uh, about the von Neumann's personal connections uh, and his work in economics, in mathematical economics, uh, with mathematics. It is not very clear how he came to make interact some specific theories coming from mathematics. We know that he's a mathematician, but as we take and as uh, subsequent generations of mathematical economists took for granted and took what he did as a, as a block, as a formal block, the different connections between topology, convex theory, uh, uh, theory of systems of linear equations and inequalities, all these things kind of were put together without thinking or without even uh, um, knowing that uh, at some point they had to be also put together, right? They were not always uh, put together in, the, in this way. So uh, what I'm really interested in this project and um, is this idea of, uh, of the mystery thing, right? Of the mystery aspect, which embodies two, two mysteries, right? What happens in the history of mathematics and what happens in the history of economics and how they, they are intertwined in von Neumann's work, right? And uh, part of, uh, I've been working on von Neumann now for a couple of years and uh, I've, uh, I've started, I feel that I've started to resolve this kind of mystery and uh, the first uh, published output of this work uh, was uh, recently published um, um, in Hope. And uh, yeah, with the title of uh, the paper that was published, you, uh, well, uh, it was about uh, um, 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 unlocking the mystery of the origins of John von Neumann's growth model paper. Um, in that paper, uh, what I did was that uh, on the basis, on the basis on, um, on, um, von Neumann's archives, uh, archives that have never been used, right? I'm, I'm the first one, and this is probably the most original uh, thing of that paper. Uh, I can, uh, uh, I feel confident of making two points. Uh, of course, the paper deals with, uh, it, it traces von Neumann and it traces the genesis of that paper. But for this presentation, let me just recall two things. The first one is that based on these archives, right? And in these models, there are at least 20 drafts in which von Neumann tries to model the economy, I can make two, uh, two arguments. First uh, is that uh, von Neumann's involvement with economics and social theory uh, was not something uh, that should, could be described as uh, something that von Neumann did uh, in his leisure time. It was actually a, a, a real and actual and deep commitment with economic theory. And this is something that he started doing at the end of the 20s, around 1928 and uh, that this commitment and this engagement kind of fluctuated and, ev uh, and evolved as he was traveling uh, uh, between different uh, cities in Europe and uh, in America, right? And so uh, at, at the very beginning, when he started uh, doing this, he, uh, he, uh, we are in 1928, I have a model, I have a, a piece, a, a draft that he left behind, written in German, I know, then that he was in, uh, in Berlin. And the kind of things that he did at that time kind of led me to, uh, led me to, uh, to, to believe that he was talking with, uh, for example, Marshak and that he was reading Marshak's works who was in Berlin at the time. And when he did that, when he did that, when he started working in mathematical economics, in no way he, uh, uh, well, he, he used uh, differential equations, right? And just remember that in 1928, von Neumann published his famous uh, uh, paper in which he, uh, um, uh, on game theory, right? And in which in a, in a footnote, he argued, he points out that what he was doing in uh, the theory of games in his 1928 paper, uh, well, there was this, uh, an analogy between homo economicus and homo ludens, right? But this was a passing comment. Uh, the, the, the theory of games paper in 1928, it was a mathematical piece. Right, and I know that in 1928, when he started thinking about the economy, well, he was not using at all anything that appear, uh, anything mathematical that appear in uh, the theory of games. He was using differential equations. So this leads me to uh, the second point, which is that uh, von Neumann only realized around 1932, as he was traveling and, and, and talking with other economists, and um, kind of. Uh, changing the mathematical frameworks and changing the mathematical theories that he was model modeling in his drafts, uh, it was only around 1932 that he came, um, that he became conscious of 
uh, of the connection, the formal connection between games and, 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 um, and the economy, as he was modeling it, right? And so, uh, and by formal, uh, formal uh, analogy, what I mean is that um, he uh, read some economist work, he characterized the, uh, uh, the mathematical, uh, the essential mathematical relationships of his models by reading, uh, taking insights uh, of, of the work of these economists. And then uh, he implemented and he used some of the tools that he developed in the theoretical, in, in, in the theory of games to solve the problems of his models, right? It was kind of very pragmatic. He used it in a very pragmatic way. So, and, and, and if you're familiar with his uh, growth model paper, his 9037 growth model paper, this is exactly what he does. He set a system of equations that there are uh, supposed to characterize a, a, a sort of a, an economy. And then it, uh, the connection with games also, uh, only appears when he's solving the, the problem, the, the, the system of equations. Different aspects, different moments of uh, the mathematical um, uh, work that he uh, that he's doing, but then we are in 1940, and somehow we are in the mid of 1940. Uh, Fonoyman achieved the conviction that uh, there was more than a formal analogy, right, between games and economics. And since the mid 1940, uh, since uh, the mid uh, 40s, uh, since mid uh, 1940, we're in June around uh, around June. He started believing. He he achieved this conviction that there was more than an analogy, and since that moment, he started. Uh, uh, approaching and he started taking Homo economicus and the mathematical structures that he had developed in 1928 as the, as, the, as the starting point, as the starting point to model and to think about Homo economicus. It is only at this moment that uh, games became the conceptual and the starting point of his work, right, in, 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 in mathematical economics. And since this moment, well, the economy, the, the study, the mathematical study of the economy consisted of looking at uh, uh, how two individuals interacted with each other and how they strategically, strategy uh, is an important term here, and how they strategically interacted. And of course, they have to play according to uh, the Minimax theorem that he had proved in 1928. But then uh, uh, he generalized in 1940, he generalized this to N players, to N uh, uh, player games. And, uh, and then uh, something new also happened, which is that uh, when uh, studying the economy, not only uh, in uh, one, the interaction between two individuals, but the economy as a whole, well, uh, studying the economy in that sense came to study how individuals interacted with each other and how they created coalitions and how other individuals were excluded of those coalitions and how those who were in the coalitions get uh, distributed among the members of the coalitions, the gains, and how in a society uh, who could be thought of, of as international society or in the, uh, as a, as a nation, nation or as internal society, how these different coalitions interacted with each other and how the, all these members of the same society kind of form a set, right? And uh, this, this general set included all the different possibilities. And this led von Neumann to talk about, to define something that became uh, very important for uh, in, 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 in that book, which was the, um, the, uh, the stable set, which was a way of treating economic equilibrium, uh, which entail a particular way of defining stability, stability equilibrium. So, uh, three things that I'd like to uh, to stress for this for this presentation: uh, an emphasis, a particular and original emphasis on Homo economicus and its relevance for the uh, for economics for economic theorizing, and an emphasis on strategy and an emphasis an emphasis on uh, uh, on stability. Right. So, with all this. Uh, being said, and this is only the introduction, I, I won't uh, talk much about what I do in the paper, but this is uh, the introduction of what I do. Um, well, all these kind of poses significant questions, significant problems, or which are uh, uh, questions, I like to say, let's call them questions. This sets the, the, the crucial questions of my paper, which I believe in significant ways have represented uh, important difficulties when it comes to understand von Neumann's work in mathematical economics. And the first one is how did he uh, uh, achieve the conviction that there was more than a formal analogy between economics and games? And I take this to mean, uh, 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 did he really, uh, did his uh, working on games came from nowhere? Uh, uh, and by this from nowhere, I'm, I'm really thinking about 
uh, many comments by many uh, 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 game theorists, right? When they introduce the, the, the book or their work, they say, oh, von Neumann, he is the originator of, and he came with this out of the blue, right? It came out of nowhere. Uh, and, 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 and that's kind of uh, 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 tricky. Uh, I mean, that's puzzling to me. Um, um, and of course, I think that you might uh, see already where I'm uh, getting at, uh, because the other question, the alternative is, uh, or uh, was it a meaningful analogy relative to economic and social theory? And remember that just in the paper that I've just published, I've been, I, I argued that uh, uh, the mystery, when solving the mystery, I find out or I, I, I could trace that von Neumann was actually reading the economies of work and that he felt confident to, to do what he was doing because he was reading and modeling uh, uh, what his friends' economies were doing, right? And so this leads me to the second question, which is, did von Neumann change his working practices? Uh, uh, remember also that in if he was working and discussing in informal settings with his economy's friends and reading their work and then modeling their work, uh, something that I, uh, this, is, this is part of a, of a paper that, I've, that I have to write, which is that this way of doing, uh, this way of working, that was part of his practices. And this is not something that belonged only to von Neumann, that, but this is something that reflects on the culture uh, of the mathematical culture that he represented. This is something, this is the way Göttingen mathematicians where he got his uh, uh, postdoc, he, he did a postdoc and uh, he became kind of renowned for uh, uh, enhancing and uh, promoting the Hilbertian kind of mathematics developed at Göttingen. This is how they used to work, right? Uh, uh, intense intense uh, uh, socialization and uh, uh, it was very important in uh, an informal settings, of course, and this was central in the axiomatic way of practicing mathematics at Göttingen, right? So that said, that said, in order to respond to these two questions, what I do in my paper is that I focus on some developments that were taking place at the Institute for Advanced Study where von Neumann was working uh, in 1940 uh, and since 1933, actually. And uh, I try to respond to these two questions uh, in two sections, uh, two main sections. I'm, five okay, minutes. five minutes. Okay. And so, five yes, um, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be um, on time. So here um, in the first section, I, I describe I'm, I'm quite assertive. Uh, and in, the, in this section, I, I really focus on the transition aspects. Uh, uh, I, I, I explain, I describe how, based on archival material, some of which is already known in the literature of history of economic thought, some of which is not, I, I, I describe the transition of how he came to realize that there was a formal analogy, to then to the realization that there was more than a formal analogy. And I insist on this meaningful, right? Uh, I, I think that it was meaningful to him and just in, in, a, in a few seconds, I will explain why I think it was meaningful. And just to give a hint of what happens here in one of the rooms of the, uh, of, at the Institute, um, the connection with, uh, we all know today and subsequently after 1940, after the book, it was evident that uh, there was a connection between topology, between convex theory, and between systems of linear uh, inequalities in von Neumann's work. But, and all these things have been, and because we knew that, uh, many, many commentators have thought that uh, some elements that happened in 1937 were already present in 1928. And so there was a mix. And here, I know that uh, indeed von Neumann in 1940, he was not aware of the possible connections between his work in games and the growth model with uh, a convex theory. He was not aware of that, right? And it was because uh, 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 at that time, there was a Japanese mathematician who came at the Institute, Kakutani, who published a book, a, a paper in 1941. Kakutani was collaborating with von Neumann on measure theory. And Kakutani published this, this paper in which he explained and developed the connections between uh, uh, the growth model paper between uh, 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 what von Neumann had been doing on games and convex theory, topology, convex theory, and the things and other stuff that von Neumann had been doing were connected in this way. Three different mathematical theories that are not necessarily connected. And so 
So these are the kind of things that happen and that I explain in this section. I'm quite assertive. And then uh, there is a second section. There is a second section, which is where well, there are three uh, say, there are three parts of this section. But what I do here is that I try to explain why I, I, I think that it was meaningful to von Neumann. And remember that for, for von Neumann, meaningful meant that he was inspiring. He, he, inspi he, he based his work on the basis of what economists believe or thought about the economy, right? Otherwise, he will think that it was arbitrary at some level, right? And so uh, uh, the argument here is that, um, so I respond to the second to the second question that I have, did von Neumann change his working practices? And my argument is no, uh, uh, he didn't change his working practices, but there was a change. He stopped paying attention to what, to what economists uh, were saying. And at that moment, uh, and here I have to be very careful because uh, this is conjectural history. I'm not 100% sure because I don't, I haven't found the evidence uh, of what I'm arguing. I, however, have found a panoply of uh, converging uh, evidences that let me believe uh, that what I'm saying here is is correct, is accurate, is accurate, is an accurate description of what's, uh, what was happening, and this is that. In another, in another of the rooms of uh, the Institute, there was a group of social scientists, historians, political scientists, uh, uh, sociologists who were gathering uh, in a, as a sort of a community uh, invited because they were invited by this, by uh, uh, Edward uh, Med Earl, a colleague of von Neumann at the Institute, who since the mid thirties uh, was willing to establish a program, a seminar on military policy and statecraft, who, uh, cons and this program consisted of creating a seminar uh, in which uh, he will be able to invite uh, uh, renowned uh, figures to study war as a social phenomenon. And uh, just to finish, um, uh, because uh, I'm uh, probably already out of time. One minute. One minute. Uh, in this seminar, uh, we have renowned figures who were thinking about, uh, I mean, in, 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 in Earl seminar, uh, in, full of social scientists, right? Uh, matters of stability, matters of strategy, and even homoludens actually appear as uh, relevant, as central categories. Uh, for theorizing social science. And so my take and the argument that I tried to make in this paper is that it was meaningful for von Neumann and that he felt confident to do it. Uh, it was not only a mathematical exercise. Remember, but that in 1928, he already had the paper and during 12 years, he had been working on mathematical economics and in no way he had been thinking of the economy as a game, right? He was only thinking and solving the mathematical problems of his models uh, by using uh, a formal analogy. But since 1940, he started believing that uh, the structures of, uh, of, of strategy of games, uh, of games of strategy and questions uh, were relevant and that uh, homoludens uh, was a relevant uh, uh, category to theorize, for theorizing in social science. And so I'm, I'm, I'm the argument, the main argument is that uh, it, was, it was oral seminar and some developments uh, that happened uh, at Earl Seminar, at Princeton, at the Institute for Advanced Study, that led von Neumann to believe that the application of the mathematical theory of games was meaningful to the study of, uh, of the economy. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much what happens. There is another section uh, in the paper, but um, I'm out of time. So that's it. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, please? Or comments, maybe. Who want? Yes, we shall. Hi, uh, I don't have a question per se, but I was just interested in the <clears throat> the analogy of the Homo economicus as Homo ludens, and and I was just wondering um, if you would help me just like not go through the theory of games and economic behavior, and just probably can I just find out like the theory of stable set? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, so so I was just wondering, like, um, is it there in the book itself, or do I have to go so, to read some specific? No, that's it's 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 in the book. It's in the book. That's a central point of von Neumann's work, actually. Um, let me share. Is 
it deals with this can you are you saying my yes my, yes so it deals with this it, it it's a very awkward way of describing equilibrium i mean awkward according to uh, uh this didn't uh, survive in in economic theory right because von neumann there were possible if you want if uh, there there in equilibrium there are multiple uh, possibilities right even in equilibrium. And at some point, there is one coalition that will dominate the equilibrium, right? But this equilibrium yeah. can be at any time destabilized by uh, another group could, you know, take, uh, uh, become more important, make another coalition, right? And, um, um, and the important thing is that in von Neumann's uh, uh, understanding of equilibrium, this possibility belongs to equilibrium itself, right? The possibility okay. of changing the state of matters, it is, uh, uh, it is um, this is conceptualized within the, uh, uh, the idea of equilibrium and within the idea of, set equi of, uh, of, of stable equilibrium. No, but that's you. something kind of peculiar that will not survive when the, uh, 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 the theory of games will enter into uh, microeconomics because they will, uh, Nash, Nash, uh, uh, Nash equilibrium will change everything. Ivan, please, your question. Uh, in the um, in the drafts of your paper, which uh, in the two drafts of your paper, which I was reading, there was no mention of Kakutani. So the whole episode with Kakutani comes somewhat later, I believe, in your work. So could you probably elaborate it? Because that sounds quite sweeping indeed. In particular, because von Neumann's published in 1937, the general equilibrium model did have an explicit economic, um, economic interpretation built there. So it was not just a mathematical theorem and it had already all kinds of, and the equilibrium concept was uh, uh, already there. And that was completely kind of, you know, it had a quite, it had, a, as you explain also in the paper, it had lots of uh, influences. And one of them is clearly the Cassell uh, type of equilibrium analysis of the economy, which is, which is again, the, the model of the economy probably not the model of economic behavior as in game theory but model of the economy right and what i did not understand also in the text that's what i wanted to also to ask you is the idea of production processes he had which this text idea. which which text uh in the uh, genealogy of uh, von neumann's equilibrium economic equilibrium paper if we yeah. talk about text of yours and not the text of von Neumann. No, but now, uh, in the paper, he has this notion of production processes, which many, by the way, would interpret in classical terms. And this this is the the model of production sector, and not the model of uh, uh, supply or demand or you know all these uh, th th things. So where do production processes are coming from? Uh, could it have been Leontiev? Could it have been Kassel? Could it have been people in Berlin he would he was talking with? So that's uh, something I'm uh, also thrilled to learn. So um, production in the first papers, in the first draft, uh, in the first drafts that he left behind, uh, he had some functions, some production functions. Sometimes they were simple, sometimes they were complex, sometimes they kind of uh, came out of uh, nowhere. Sometimes. But he was reading Marshak. He was talking with. Uh, I don't think he was in connection. I don't have any evidence that he was uh, that he uh, knew uh, Leontiev. I don't have. Um, but uh, to get to, the, to 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 respond perhaps in a best way is that in the way he modeled a production process, because at the beginning it was a function, but then it was a process. Um, it he he began to do this. Uh, after reading Vixel's uh, value and capital, um, he began to do that at that moment. And so in Vixel's work, you have uh, a, a nice theory in which uh, uh, the Valrhusian general equilibrium theory is well connected to well uh, theory of production. And this is related to a kind of 
uh, relatively well explained theory of capital. And this is what von Neumann is working on. This is that frames his way of putting, uh, uh, of defining uh, function as a process that is related to uh, not by a function, by as a process that is connected by a uh, by an operator. And when he does that, it is also connected to the way he's thinking uh, about these things mathematically. Because at that precise moment, he stopped using differential equations, right? And so he can model time without using differential equations. And um, um, at, at that time, he's kind of getting into a conflict with uh, Birkhoff, uh, with whom he's working on uh, some in the study of dynamical systems. And there is a controversy of credit. And so, but, uh, so this is also connected to these kind of issues. And then uh, uh, there is Castle. And in Castle, in comparison with Vexel, uh, in, in Castle, you only have, uh, there is no distinction between different kinds of capitals. There is only one way of defining capital. And so, so forth. This is something that, you, that, that appears in the paper. Uh, I hope that I respond <laughs> to that, to your you, question. You. Catherine, now your question. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Juan. So I have many questions. I know I see that you're out of time, so I'm, I have a very general one at this point. Um, so far, uh, a lot of people like you know um, Leonard and others who have worked on von Neumann and game the in the history of game theory have attributed, of course, a lot of explanatory um, you know power to Morgenstern entering in von Neumann's life and. Um, it seems as if you are giving a narrative or a story here that would, you know, um, yeah, um, uh, give Morgenstern even less credit than he already has gotten by historians. So I wonder what your story means for his influence um, on von Neumann in the sense, uh, especially um, that he might have impacted this idea of meaningfulness. Right and uh, the way in which you know just formal systems that were you know um, certain mathematical uh, results might have an application also in economics, you know, seeing you know via via Morgenstern the the actual potential to apply it somewhere in namely in the social sciences. So I wonder what story uh, what your story implies for the role of Morgenstern. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. That's a difficult one, uh, but um, let, so I think that in there is a common agreement in uh, this literature, which is that uh, Mongerson had a crucial uh, uh, role in the making of the book, uh, uh, in the sense that the book will have never been published in the way it was published uh, uh, without Morgenstern, right? He was he 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 played that role but more in the making of the book. Um, what I try to pull in this paper is probably more about the, the drafts on which the book was written, right? And um, those drafts, uh, there are two drafts, uh, non-drafts, uh, the theory of games one, theory of, of, uh, of games two, uh, there were papers that, uh, drafts that von Neumann wrote at the end of 1940 and at the beginning of 1941. And uh, in those drafts, I don't think that for, uh, that Morgenstern played any particular role. Um, uh, Can I they, have a quick follow up on that? Yeah. Very quick. It's like Morgenstern had also these drafts, right? Where he, from influenced by the Austrian experience, he had the idea of how can we actually conceptualize interaction much better? Just throwing this in there, but we can discuss later. Yeah, no. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are coming to our last speaker, Richard Chaudhry, please, your, your turn. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I wouldn't say I'm... Um, I feel like I'm not a uh, I'm not a perfect historian as yet. I'm still in the process of it. Um, but this paper, I came about um, thinking about what I was reading for one of my political economy classes, where I was reading about um, uh, classical political economists, and then we were reading about labor and 
um, the traditions that come out of classical political economy, specifically Marx's work. And I was thinking that, well, it just seems like there is a way that capital has been penetrating beyond the dynamics that um, theory has been talking about. And I just wanted to get this uh, out of my way, uh, what I'm trying to argue. And the primary argument of this essay is that, um, that, that there exists a penetrative dynamic of capital into the distinction between labor and labor power. I will just get into it a little bit more in the, uh, in the following slides. But the way that I have been thinking about it is that there have been different dynamics, institutional dynamics, through which this has happened. And I think it has happened in just a purely like ingenious and pluralistic manner. And one of the best examples that I can think about when we are talking about pluralistic ways of how this penetrative uh, dynamic has happened is, is that currently we're talking about intersectionality in terms of intersectionality of caste, um, race, gender, and that literature. So the theoretical framework I, I'm using here is a specific one uh, within the tradition of, uh, that emanates out of Marx, which is basically talking about uh, the entry point uh, concept of class, which was forwarded by Wolf and Resnick and that kind of uh, came out of Althusser. And it is a Marxian ep epistemological stand of overdetermination. Now, why, did, why, did I, why is it that I chose this specific uh, uh, theoretical framework. The first point is obviously it helped me uh, steer clear of getting into the weeds of uh, numerous theoretical traditions. And it kind of enables us uh, to situate a conceptual apparatus and concentrate on the argument that capital has penetrated uh, the distinction between labor and labor power. And that is the main argument that I'm actually making in this essay. And obviously the second thing what, what I'm forwarding and why uh, second argument that I'm putting forward uh, is, with, is, is a critique of this framework that I'm using to evaluate the penetrative dynamic of capital is that what I'm saying, well, if you, if you do have, if I'm actually validly arguing that there's a penetrative dynamic of capital, then this, then the political project that this particular Marxist approach propagates, um, like there's certain issues there and which I'm just highlighting. I'm, I'm not there to provide a solution. I'm saying, well, there just seems to be um, a problem there. So first thing first, uh, um, it, what I'm arguing is that this is a very specific discovery of Marx, where I'm kind of trying to say that this is a distinction between um, the old system and the new, which is obviously the capitalist mode of production. And this kind of goes into, um, Professor Anig, uh, Oleg, uh, Professor Oleg's uh, uh, arguments, where you're talking about mercantilism and capitalism. So I'm, I'm. When I was writing this paper, I was kind of getting a quagmire into figuring out that issue, and that was kind of becoming problematic. So I was like, okay, let's just take this specific to be a specific discovery of Marx, where he's defining the capitalist mode of production, uh, very different from the other social forms of production. And what he's trying to point at is that uh, there's a unique aspect uh, of the purchase and consumption of the commodity labor power uh, is that what is being purchased by the capitalist exists only as potential uh, and that which is received in actuality depends on the extent to which labor is extracted from labor power and that is the primary source of uh, surplus value. And Marx was adamant uh, in volume one where he's like, well, the only thing that can make a person into a capitalist um, is not in exchange, but rather in, um, in the sphere of production. And why I'm saying that is because I'm making an implicit assumption here. Uh, there is obviously the possibility of accumulation even in exchange uh, and something that is not missed by Marx in volume three, but I'm saying, well, that possibility is there, but I'm making an assumption that we stick to the assumption that he makes in volume one where equivalence which are being exchanged and the commodity is paid for its full value so there is no problematic of uh, having a, a separation of exchange and use value i'm saying at that point well this is equal 
so that there's no involvement of exchange per se, and I don't have to get into that debate. Now, obviously, in the specific discovery of Marx, uh, uh, the starting point of the process of capitalist production, he's talking about a labor free in the double sense. And the best counter example that I've come across, and this is again me trying to force uh, the argument that, well, I'm just looking at us uh, from the vantage point of this particular system, which Marx says is the starting point of the process of capitalist production. And the argument is like the distinction between uh, slavery and capitalism per se. Now, in most of the essay, the crucial point is me trying to formulate an argument uh, from a theoretical viewpoint to come to a point when I'm arguing as to why there's a penetrative, uh, um, penetrative dynamic of capital. Now to place that debate, I think the best two examples of looking at it would be the work of Dobb and Banaji. And they're quite different from, uh, they, they belong to different traditions in Marx, Marxian political economy. And what I'm trying to get at is that um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, argue that both of the viewpoints have its own problem, but it is the unity between the two viewpoints that I'm primarily propagating to really understand how capital has been uh, able to undertake uh, uh, the penetration. So Dobb argues that, well, when you think about the starting process of capitalist production, it doesn't mean that there's a sharp, sharp dividing line, which is kind of understandable. Uh, but the starting point of capitalist production is in reference to the point at which the influence of single more or less homogeneous economic form becomes preponderant. And what he's referring to here specifically uh, is the component of waged labor, which is the realization of the distinction between labor, labor and lab, the distinction between labor, labor power and labor into the waged form. But there remains, when Dobb is arguing and such, there remains the nagging question that does the distinction necessarily needs to be realized in one specific form? The one specific form meaning waged labor. Given the two foundational conditions that we've just talked about, um, that must be satisfied to understand the starting process of capitalist production, so, uh, many will argue in the affirmative. The emphasis of this essay is not to question whether it is the preponderant form or not, whether wage labor is the more dominating factor in the economy or not. As Monk has argued, it still is um, by the end of the 20th century. I'm looking into dynamics of digital economy, but, but that is a side note. But rather, the main argument of this piece is to rather to map the ingenuity with which capital has evolved and has been able to penetrate the distinction. And I think, and I'm trying to argue, uh, the best way to put forward what I'm trying to get at is to compare Dobb to that of Banaji's work. Now, the main critique that Banaji has against Dobb's evaluation is he's saying that when you have one preponderant form, in which the distinction between labor power and labor has to be realized, meaning wage labor, then you're effectively assuming a virtual identity between the forms of exploitation and the relations of production. The forms of exploitation and the re relations of production. And that is what uh, he's getting at. And this is uh, kind of put forward by Banaji by exampling the 19th century deck in India, where he's like the peasant households are dependent on the money capitalist, basically the colonial, uh, colonial money capitalist for capital that was necessary for the reproduction due precisely to the advent of the commodity market under the aegis of the colonial administrators. This capital advanced is recuperated through the surrender of the whole of his crop by way of interest payments. The argument is that behind the superficial surface sale of products required to pay the interest payments is that the price received by the peasant household is not a pure category of exchange, but a category that is a relation of production, a concealed wage. So he's saying, well, you cannot just simply assume that this distinction or the source of surplus comes about uh, only in the wage form. And it does not have to come up, come about in the in the purest in the purest 
in the purest wage form, but you can also think about it in other dimensions of like concealed wage, this is example in tech in India, and he's saying the relations of production and the forms uh, and the forms of exploitation don't have to be specified and you cannot like just scoop them together. If you do so, he says, uh, the functioning of the capitalist system is radically impoverished. But the problem with Banerjee's work is that then how do we define the starting point of the capitalist production, which is this, how can we still assimilate his analysis uh, within the two foundational conditions that we talked about. And the problem is that we cannot, because he's arguing and he's uh, basically talking about, and the one example that I specifically want to point out was that he cursorily delves into the issue of free and unfree labor as something that needs to be understood beyond that of the simple meaning of being materially dispossessed. However, the materiality is crucial for Marx, for the dichotomy for Marx is not between free and unfree labor, but rather free in the double sense. Now, what I'm trying to get at with that is that, okay, fine, Dob talked about that we need to have uh, the distinction realized in the wage form. And then Banerjee comes about and said, well, look at colonial examples and we can see that it does not have to be realized in the same form. And what I'm trying to get at when you, when you, when I'm trying to explain that there has been a penetrative dynamic of capital is to find a way to combine both of them. Meaning that the forms of exploitation and the relationship production in the current context, at least, does not have to be in its purely um, in its purely waged form, but also it needs to be justified by what framework I'm using, meaning the two foundational conditions also need to be satisfied. And this is what the primary argument is, that is there a virtual identity through, and I'm forwarding it uh, through a proposed re-articulation of the idea of abstract labor. And to situate, what I'm trying to argue here, you can think about the relationship between production and reproduction and Bowles and Gintis are specifically important here where they say that the labor theory of values to economistic when specifically you think about the household production and the labor that goes and works in the factory and he's saying well abstract labor uh, is, is you can use abstract labor when you think about capital and worker but the production of labor itself in the household cannot be thought of in terms of abstract labor. But I think uh, there seems to be uh, a kind of uh, why is it uh, that the thing that this value is economistic and the issue that I'm primarily handing is like there still seems to be a component of external to it meaning that Bowles and Gintis are talking about it in terms of how the household plays a role in providing the production of labor for capital. But suddenly that when, when the production is done in the household sector, which is obviously what the literature of reproduction talks about, but as soon as the production is of labor done with and it reaches the factory, again, we are under the assumption that, well, it's abstract labor and capital is uh, still uh, interacting with labor in those terms. But can we assimilate both of them? Can we assimilate this idea that abstract labor is problematic? And I'm saying that abstract labor needs, needs to have a reformulation if we are thinking about unifying the virtual identity, which is the relationship production and um, the forms of exploitation. Five minutes. I you have five minutes. Yes, sir, I'll be done. This is uh, my second last slide. <clears throat> so, um, but what I said in the previous slide was that Bowles and Gintis arguments still seems to have a sense of external. It has still not been, it is still the similar dynamic that I pointed out when I was comparing Dob and uh, Banaji. And the basis of the argument forwarded by Bowles and Gintis is hinged on questioning the peculiar property of labor power that depends on how abstract labor is taken to be a measure of value. They ask as to why we cannot take corn as did Ricardo 
as corn or abstract labor or the fictional invariable standard if it ever did exist or if it ever does exist, which is the problem that Sarafa and Krishna Bhardwaj tackled all their lives, could, we, could all be used quite effectively to show the existence of exploitation. Now, the only way in which the special character of labor can be justified as the basis for the labor theory of value is to consider the non-commodity aspect of wage labor. As we are talking about the production of the non-commodity aspect of labor power, labor itself. Now that is still a dynamic where they're saying, well, you're producing labor and this production process of the labor in the household cannot be understood in the purest form of abstract labor. But once the production is done beyond the household and you go to capital and worker uh, conflict, then again, we are back to evaluating in terms of abstract labor. So, the, but the issue that I have here is that when they do that analogy, they have to stick to the necessary labor argument when talking about the role of the site of the household where the labor is being produced. Now, my question is, is there no surplus labor to be had? The commodification argument, the commodification of labor, which is one of the crucial foundational aspects, does not need to be given up if we are to, te if we are to te tweak the very idea of abstract labor. In fact, corn was used by Ricardo precisely due to the issues associated with the invariable standard that he had been tackling. If abstract labor is understood to be enmeshed in the appropriative political and cultural practices of the household, then couldn't we argue that there in fact is a potentiality to the amount of surplus that can be extracted from the actual labor perform. So what I'm trying to get at is that this idea that you need to have uh, abstract labor that is being pulled out by capital does not necessarily need to hold in the present context. Now, the idea is that the, this commodification is not according to labor, but the capital has been able to penetrate the dynamic where this commodification is in terms of the individual. Now, you can think of it like, when the commodification is of labor, it's a very abstract world. There's no political and cultural sides, but when we think about it in terms of a, a commodification of an individual, you can think of it in, in, in terms of how it is done within the political and cultural sites. For example, the best example that I can think about is uh, Sanyal's emphasis on the role of household as an added side of production, which I'm trying to argue that, you know, he says, well, you have the, household production system in India, uh, the urban household production system in India, where the, uh, where, uh, <clears throat> the objective conditions of uh, labor has been uh, separated from the subjective conditions of labor, meaning the means of production. Uh, they have been removed from the means of production, but they're still not paid in waged labor. So they are outside the capitalist system. And I'm saying, well, no, it doesn't have to be. If you think of it in terms of the commodification of the individual, where even though the payment is in the form of consumption, uh, consumption rather than wage labor, you can still think of it as a penetrative dynamic of capital, because that house, urban household production system is uh, crucial to how capital is functioning in India. I just want to end with, um, I didn't get the time to get here because I can see the time, it's almost one minute. The issue that I'm having and which I'm going to progress in the future is that in this epistemological stand of overdetermination, there still seems to be um, um, like what they have been criticized with Engels' work, which is um, uh, at the last instance. Uh, at the last instance, it becomes determined. And what I see is that economically, in economic theory, um, when they're talking about the class process, yes, they do realize that there's overdeterminism, as in like an individual is within the cultural and political sites. But when they get to this idea of class struggle, they're like, well, we cannot emphasize um, the, uh, the subjects of the group struggling, but rather the objects of the group struggling, meaning that they come back uh, to, the, uh, to the idea of class struggle being just uh, emphasized on the distinction between labor power and labor. And I'm saying, well, capital has penetrated beyond that dynamic where it is not doing just commodification of labor, but it is now undertaking the commodification of individual, which I'm trying to now get into by talking more about digital labor. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, questions, comments? Well, no, no comments, no, no questions. Well, probably I have one question just to understand better. Yes. Uh, what you mean by commodification, uh, commodification of an individual? How can uh, it be uh, understood? So I what think uh, I'm, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm also still uh, figuring it out. But the way I can think about it is, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and that's how I'm thinking it of myself. I'm thinking of an analogy from a horror movie. You can think of it in terms of, uh, you know, or like not a horror movie, actually. Um, let me give you a better analogy from Harry Potter. <laughs> when, you know, this, uh, this Dementor comes and sucks the soul out and you can see uh, the individual and um, the happiness being sucked out, but it can be anything. But I'm thinking that the commodification of individual would be that when capital is extracting a certain amount of surplus, if we are sticking to the framework of um, labor theory of value, capital does not, it probably in history, it mattered to it that it, it was abstract labor terms, as in it didn't matter who that person was. It just mattered as to whether it got the abstract labor so I could compare everything. But I'm saying that when the commodification of individuals are being undertaken, capital is very, very much involved in understanding that who they are getting the surplus out of. Um, but and, uh, what labor in this case is abstract labor, a labor of uh, a mother who are giving birth or care labor in the family? What, what is meant? here by abstract labor here abstract labor would mean very fact that uh, there's a gender dynamic in that abstract labor it is a woman who does the work in the household mm -hmm. if it was a man it would have been different so it's, it's not bowles and gintis are saying well in the household you have this dynamic of culture and political sites yes i agree with that and that is kind of the literature on reproduction but i'm saying even when you go this idea of just having factory workers and it is done in abstract labor, it is not true anymore because they are not doing it just to get that abstract labor. They very much know the dynamics of the society to understand that it's going to be a man that is going to be doing the worker. Or for example, in the American case, what I'm looking in, um, into is the cost of job loss along racial dynamics. Or in the case of India, you can think about the urban household in terms of the patriarchal relationships because the owner of that household production system is still a man in the major. So that's what I'm trying to uh, figure out myself too, I'll be honest. Well, any more questions? Uh, well, uh, I'll make a short comment then. Uh, when you are just start uh, to, to, to present your paper, I thought first that you are talking about uh, well, this penetration of capital, uh, that uh, this, this is a kind of primitive, uh, the, the period of primitive accumulation in terms of Marx, Marx when the society is not yet capitalist, and there are non-capitalist parts of the society and the uh, transformation of this society into capitalist society is a kind of process and you are interested in uh, these uh, intermediate stages of this process. Uh, but then, and this is a kind of uh, really interesting questions to, to extend Marxian analysis to this uh, intermediate stage of capitalism um, formation. But then you are talking more about family, uh, family labor and uh, how this family labor is becoming uh, commodified. Uh, no. but maybe in, in, in case of uh, India, for instance, and some other developing countries, these two processes could be inter, inter, intermingled somehow in, uh, overlapping in some sense, but I think that theoretically we should 
differentiate these two processes uh, because of course uh, the problem of uh, involving uh, uh, this home labor into economic analysis is a major problem i think uh, not not connected specifically to marxism or, or mainstream who are uh, discussing today what does it mean gdp and so on they they are also thinking about how to uh, to calculate this home labor what does it mean and so on so it is a, a kind of uh, very broad uh, question and maybe it is interesting to think in marxian terms about it uh, so so it is a very specific aspect because of course marx uh, we can find in marx uh, the idea that uh, uh, economic analysis or social analysis should involve all this uh, production of human human lives uh, reproduction of human lives into reproduction process and this idea uh, well is as, as a kind of unresolved question exists but really unresolved uh, up to now so it is interesting but it is more it is different from the problem of uh, in, uh, intermediate stages of uh, development of uh, pure capitalism so uh, involving the trend from some kind of mixed society to more or less pure capitalist society uh, of course it is Im important for developing countries uh, but i think it is not identical processes and it's better to to differentiate them well, it's just comment from what I could understand from your presentation. So uh, no more questions, no more comments. If no, then I sorry, I just, yes, could I uh, could I just I'm I think that's a very very interesting uh, way uh, how uh, you put it. But I think I'm not getting into the issue of, uh, and I need to be clearer. I think. Uh, where I'm not talking about it in terms of uh, it being an intermediate stage and transitioning. And that is the debate that exists even in India, like uh, where Banaji is on one side and the um, mode of production debate from Utsa Patnaik and everyone. But I'm saying that um, these two contrasting extreme examples, like where you have this, uh, the moment of arrival of capitalism, at least for colonial countries, and versus this idea that you need, we're going to transition to a purely capitalist system. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting into the weeds of it where I'm arguing, well, it might not happen because capital does not necessarily need to be understood to be extracting uh, surplus in, on, in terms of abstract labor, where then you can just have the relationship between capital and worker. And I'm saying, well, you can just persist and subsist. And actually, capital is making sure that we are always in this formulation of intermediate stage because they have realized that you can now have surplus by realizing that it's not just abstract labor, but you are getting the surplus out of each and every targeted individual. And that is what I'm trying to um, get at with uh, the digital economy piece that I'm currently working on. But thank you so much. Uh, I will keep it in mind. I need to be clearer about that specifically because it's a yes. paper on yes. marks. Yes, yes. Otherwise, Thank I'll you. always get the question on that. Thank you so much. Thank you to all participants of our session. And uh, well, I think it was uh, useful and interesting. Uh, discussions were uh, enriching. Thanks for all. Goodbye. The session is over. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Juan. Nice to see you, Professor. Goodbye. Nice to see you, Vishal. Goodbye.